Hello, Balanced Beamers, and welcome back to the new and improved, refocused version of Balanced Beam Pod TV. This new element, the new level of where we're taking the Balanced Beam Podcast is timely. Most of you have been emailing and writing and saying, where is Balanced Beam? What is going on? We're missing all those things about infusing balance in life and business. So we wanted to take a step back and make sure that what we give you is true to the nature of what you're requesting. So after about six or seven months of a little bit of a layoff, we've been scrounging together all the elements of the core things you need to do to effectively balance your life and business. I'm your host, Nikita Thigpen, and I'm an advisor to other advisors, those that lead people in developing their businesses their life, their health, their wealth, and all the things that make this world go around. Most of the people I work with are business leaders for small and mid-sized businesses, as well as professionals across the gamut. Every single person that I seem to be drawn to happens to be a little peculiar, a little creative. And those are the people that we love the most. It's okay if you don't walk in the role of a creative, if you're not a marketing director or a designer, but if you work with other people, if you have to communicate with teams, uh, employees, and even peers, especially customers, you have to be creative in your way and your ability to communicate effectively to make sure that you're not only being an active listener, but you're balancing your mind where you are and all those scattered things that go on, as well as being present in the moment so you can hear them. So those are some of the things that I help people do, not just in their communication, but tangibly in their business as well with increasing visibility and all those things that matter for growing your business. What I want to do today is put a little spin on it. We looked across the gamut of all the people that we wanted and researched and craved to interview, from people that you may know really, really well, to really awesome, amazing, incredible diamonds that you may not even know exist. And today, we're going to interview one of those. His name is Rob Grass. He is a former district attorney, a litigator, a trial consultant, and an entrepreneur, just to name a few things. So right as soon as we get back from this commercial, you're going to hear straight from Rob a little bit about balancing justice and liberation. Stay tuned. Do you pay more than $100 a month for meds? Healthcare Solutions of Delaware Valley can save you money. Healthcare Solutions has a program that has saved patients an average of $300 per month. Get your meds for less. Call Healthcare Solution of Delaware Valley, 484-234-2427, or visit healthcaresolutionsdv.org. For more info, click the link at iradiophilly.com for Healthcare Solutions. On a mission to improve your health and save you money. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Balance Beam. We have an amazing, incredible, interesting gentleman named Rob Grab, who is going to bring a little bit of balance and justice to the show this morning. (laughs) Rob is a trial attorney. He deals with all the icky, sticky stuff that we get to sit back and watch on television and not have to worry about too many of those details unless you're one of his clients. That's completely different. Uh, Rob, welcome to the show. How are you today? All right. How are you? I am amazing. Mm -hmm. You and I were just talking a few minutes ago about life Mm -hmm. challenges and me breaking things as I normally do (laughs) technology-wise, so I'm glad you stuck around. (laughs) (laughs) I'm here. Thank you. I know you're a very busy gentleman and you have your own law practice Mm -hmm. in the midst of a million other things that you're doing. Why don't we just start by you telling us a little bit about what you do and how you balance being an entrepreneur. All right. Um, Well, as as you mentioned, I'm a trial attorney. I have my own small law firm. I do criminal law. I do some small claims, unemployment compensation. I also have a practice where I do consulting with attorneys, and I help them with their practice in the courtroom as well. Um, 
So attorneys that do commercial litigation and have never been in a courtroom before because commercial litigation normally doesn't require a lot of courtroom work. Or attorneys that want to expand their practice. I work with them. Um, beyond that, as you said, you know, with balance, I, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a, a networker, I'm a, I, I, I do a lot. So it really is a lot of jobs. I, I like to say two are, two are actual businesses, and then the rest is every other job that I have that fills up the rest of my life. Um, but so what I do is <laughs> I try to balance everything. You're right. I really do. Um, I actually had a trial to be in February. February was an interesting month because it, mm -hmm. for the shortest month of the year, it was very long. Yeah. I, uh, the first week, I go to court. I had a case. The judge said, I requested a continuance. The judge says, no, we're going to trial. So we're starting Tuesday afternoon. Oh. Tuesday morning, I had a class in the city. I then drove out to Ballot Kinwood area and worked with a client for my consulting business. Drove back to Delaware County Courthouse and started a trial Tuesday afternoon. So that it, is crazy because that was no pre planning for this. You had something already scheduled and he just totally, or he or she, whoever the judge mm -hmm. was, rocked your ship and turned your whole schedule around. Pretty much. Um, and as you said, the icky stuff that you don't have to deal with unless you're one of my clients. My client said to me, um, I'm really nervous about going to trial tomorrow. I said, I, I don't know why. Uh, I'm doing all the work. I was joking. I think it relaxed. I think it broke the ice. I hope it broke the ice. Anyway, we got a not guilty, so that's all that's important in the end. Um. <laughs> well, that was awesome for you and for, for him, for whatever mm -hmm. the, the challenges were around yeah. this case. You just brought up such an amazing point. Um, when I'm talking to professionals on all different levels, we often talk about how inflexible some schedules can be. Mm -hmm. And as an entrepreneur, you have to plan ahead to know where you're going, what event you're signing up for, make your make sure you're a part of the appropriate circles and those dates are fit in. Mm -hmm. But then you have all these things that could just rock your whole schedule completely, which meant, I'm assuming, that if you had something else scheduled for Tuesday that now has to get pushed into another day that might have been important for your work or for your family. Yeah. How do you deal with those time commitments that can become really a major conflict, especially at home? I, I guess I have an understanding spouse and a, a child that's sort of flexible. He's almost four, so he's okay. sort of flexible. Mm -hmm. um, but it, for myself, it's just keeping the focus on what I need to do and knowing, accepting that there's going to be late nights. Yeah. Accepting that I am going to be sitting in the basement while the rest of my family is asleep upstairs and I'm going to be prepping the case. And I'm going to have to explain to clients, look, if I have to meet with them at the time, and fortunately my beginning of February was supposed to be relatively light, um, that I'm going to have to reschedule. Um, when I spoke with the client that I met with on that Tuesday at 1030, he said to me, look, uh, we can reschedule if you'd like. I said, no, we made this commitment, and I was, I was prepared from the night before to move forward and say, all right, I know what I'm doing. Um, I'd like to give this example. Let's say you're running, you're running late in the morning. You, you have a meeting at 9 a.m., and you're just behind. Whatever it is, you're just behind. If you think the entire time, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late, I have to get there, I have to get there, your level of stress just goes through the roof. Vice versa, if you just say, I'm going to be late, there's nothing I can do about it, I'm just running behind, your whole mentality changes because you're not yeah. stressed, you're not speeding, you're not racing through traffic, you're not waiting and saying, where is, when's the train going to get here, when is this going to occur? You have to keep that mindset where you are in control. You're the one that set up that factor, you're the one that set up whatever circumstances that might be out of your control. How, so how do you deal with it? How do you respond to those situations? And, and I, I like to explain it in this sense, even when I'm dealing with clients, it's about responding versus reacting. Yeah. And a lot of times responding is just taking that one second step and saying, okay, now what? And, and moving on from there. And, and that's how you, and you have to deal with it most of the things that come in life, especially if you own your own business. You never know what's going to happen. I mean, if you were in the service industry, um, you basically have to say, all right, I'm at the control 
at the whim of clients, at the whim of other things that occur in my life, and I have to make sure that they are all in a row so that I can make sure everything works, but not getting stressed by it because you know things are going to go wrong. That's all true. I mean, the reality is you have to do a self-check about mm -hmm. the fact that this is life and yeah. life is going to happen. So I like to prepare people and equip them with tools, you know, so that's part of what my business is, is making sure people are educated and equipped mm -hmm. with whatever they need to have to infuse this balance in life and business. And sometimes it's those tangible things that you're talking about when you're sitting with a client and literally preparing him or her um, a to Z, this is what I need you to do to take care of this, show up at this time, don't be late, you know, all those specific technical elements. Mm -hmm. And then those, those, those things that you can't really um, give to someone and that mindset resetting process about how do you respond to a situation? What are you really going to think about and how are you going to um, access your resources that are internal so you don't flip the table over because airplane mode came on the computer when you needed the internet to work, <laughs> which was a real situation this morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but those things, you're so 100% right, like more than you can imagine. But then there's that sticky, icky place, too, that's mm -hmm. not necessarily work, but at home with amazing, incredible spouses that we both have. Um, I know mine is in, incredibly awesome with mm -hmm. his ability to not flip a table because I disappointed because I had to take care of something else. And I know your wife is the same way. She's mm -hmm. incredibly awesome. Um, but those are there's moments when they're not that awesome because yeah. they really feel like there's too many disappointments coming in a row, um, which they understand because you're paying bills, you're assisting, you're providing a lifestyle, you're walking in your purpose. They get it, and they 100% support you in it until it becomes a little too much sequentially in kind of a tight space or row. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> my husband and I had um, an awesome experience, and I use awesome in such a beautiful, sweet, and sarcastic way <laughs> in, this, mm -hmm. in this way, um, where I just couldn't, I wasn't on time when, I, when he needed me to be several seasons in a row, you might as well say, for several events. And it, he's a he's a timekeeper. And I help people with their time management. Mm -hmm. So he's like, listen, lady, what's going on? Like, where, <laughs> you know, is my time not as important as mm -hmm. your client's time? So sometimes I think that they feel um, a little less behind in your schedule. And then mm -hmm. that can be a challenge. And you got to carve out a new way to apologize and, and bring that sentiment and you still have to have yourself on the list somewhere, somehow, mm -hmm. and that can be interesting. So I'm curious, and how do you deal with those small, infrequent moments that <laughs> the awesome, incredible isn't so awesome? Well, you know, that, that's something I dealt with this week and have been trying to figure out since I've left my firm and started or left working for somebody and started my own business is how do I – let the people around me know what my schedule is going to be. Yeah. Um, it, it's difficult because there's confidentiality issues with certain clients and there's networking events that aren't confidential that everybody needs to know about or I have things at different hours that might pop up out of nowhere. So how do I do that? Um, I, I use a Google Calendar and I, I, I print it out every week and, and I send it over. Um, I, I keep names off of it. I just kind of schedule and block the time. It keeps me on track. It keeps mm -hmm. my wife in the loop. Um, I also let her know every day. Um, however, I just found out this morning that I have a, I'm out every night this week, and then I found out Friday I have something as well. So mm -hmm. that adds another thing. It, it adds another stressor. And the best thing you know I, I, that I can say is, there's only so much we can do. Yeah. As as individuals, there's only so much we can do, um, and there's only so much we can give. So, always take time for yourself. Yeah. But vice versa, um, using your husband as an example, um, 
he got upset because you weren't on time. Mm -hmm. But it was how you would respond to those situations. So he's upset. But what we're, what's really going on is that he might he feels left out. He feels left behind. Now yeah. you you have two choices on how to respond to that. You can either blow up at him and be like, "I have work to do. This is what I do," or you can listen. <laughs> Not saying you did that, and the, and by the face you made, maybe you did do that. <laughs> Or, or you can see what he's really saying and why he's really saying what he do, did and, and try to hear him out and be empathetic of what he is saying. So a lot of the times I hear, I had a bad day at work and uh, this happened and this happened. Now you're going out. Well, I, I can't fight back. I'd love to fight back. I'm a person that likes to fight back, especially when somebody's pushing on me. But yeah. that, that's not going to help. Um, my wife and I had a conversation one time where, I didn't do something. I don't remember what I didn't do. I didn't tell her something. I know that. Um, and something was going on in her work where she was upset because people weren't listening to her. So she just felt like people didn't care because they weren't listening to her. And when we got to that point, it was a, we could have a conversation. But me fighting back and saying, you, I don't listen or you don't listen and this is ridiculous or you didn't tell me isn't helping the situation. So you have to Again, take that deep breath and respond rather than reacting and really thinking about what that other person is doing. And it's difficult. I know it's difficult because I still have issues with it. And at mornings when I'm running late, I'm like, why is there nobody here to help me? And I'm thinking to myself, why am I thinking this in my head? I wouldn't, I mean, that, that's not helping me as I'm sitting there doing dishes, that, cursing out other people in my head that aren't around. That's not helping anybody and just making me more stressed and more tired. Yeah. Um, as I said, we only have all that, only a certain amount of energy. So why use it up on the negative things? No, I completely agree um, on so many levels. So to answer your question, although I know you weren't trying to get me in trouble by asking the question, I, of course, would never curse out my husband. Um, <laughs> so we had a, a string of those events, and one was a little more heated than others, and the others were more relevant to what you said, which sometimes is because of other stuff that's going on and it gets projected mm -hmm. onto the exactly. situation. Um, I often say to myself, I have to be really careful in the moment when someone is, um, you know, just taking me to another level that I prefer not to go. I do a self-check-in with Nikita. Is this about them? Because otherwise, you're about to give them something that doesn't belong to them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not a threat to the person. It's just the reality of I could react to whatever that situation is, the, you know, the rude customer service situation or whatever, and just, you know, check it in the moment. But I could also be giving that argument from my husband or the fact that I just had to deal with the teens um, and all of their lovely, awesome, amazing drama. And that's what that customer service representative who was a little quirky with me is actually about to get more so than just the situation. So mm -hmm. I totally hear you on every level. It's so interesting. I'm laughing at you, uh, which you could, of course, you could see uh, when you were like, oh, I like to fight, but I'm really careful about, you know, <laughs> fighting certain things. You're a child attorney. Of course you like to fight. It's ingrained in your blood. It makes sense. <laughs> I just heard somebody say yesterday, nobody really likes confrontation. I was like, no, people love confrontation. They yeah. thrive on it. Absolutely. But not everybody can handle it. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I'm sure you eat some people alive in the courtroom who, you know, what the wrong game? Oh, right no, 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 no. <laughs> Not you. You know that other person, that other, hey, hey, that other. Uh, yeah. Friend. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> we each have oh, roles. Okay. You're. Uh, what'd you say? We each have roles. You know, we have our identity, but then we have roles, different roles that we play. Absolutely. In different things. It's that side. I I switch between my pearls and my heels, which is that very. Um, boardroom professional side that you get to see when we're out in those connection meetings where we cross paths. Mm -hmm. And then I have, you know, the jeans and ballet flat side, which is a little <laughs> bit <laughs> more ready to go. So <laughs> I hear that. Um, but you are, speaking of that perfect segue, you're an avid networker. So in addition to actively working in your business, 
um, and managing your family and all the other multiple things that you manage. You're working on your business when you're doing your business development building out at these networking events, which is mm -hmm. another time consumer. Um, but in addition to the time, because we get it, you know, some things you make, some things you don't make. But then there's that element of those professional boundaries that come up. And people know what you do. So yeah. they're like, oh, wait, um, I have a cousin, nephew, sister, cousin, brother who has a situation that you may be able to help with. And you're like, okay, that's really not how that works. You know, we can have a conversation. We can set up a mm -hmm. meeting, but they're trying to get free advice from you in the moment. How do you work with that without, you know, you get three minutes at a networking event when there's 500 people you want to see. So how do you kind of quell those people to, you know? Well, I, I think I might have an easier time because uh, of the, the attorney situation and say, well, it could be this, but I, don't, I can't tell you because I don't know all the facts. That person would have to give me a call and let me know what's going on. Okay. I, I, need, I need more information. I, I, never, I can never give the answer without more information. Um, a lot of the times where I'm networking, simply because of my consulting business as well, I'm working with other attorneys. So yeah. fortunately, they, I, I get a lot of my legal referrals simply from other attorneys. So it, it actually saves me that extra step of being out on the street and meeting people. Um, mm -hmm. Although you never know. I, I, I have clients right now who I've met on the street. Um, but they come from all over. What I try to do is I can't give you the answer without having more information. So, yeah, a lot of the times I've heard, well, my wife had this situation with X, Y, and Z. Well, I need your wife to give me a call because right. you don't know. And I, I can't even answer the questions. And I say, as a good attorney is not going to answer those questions for you. A good right. attorney is going to know their limits and their limitations on when questions come up. Um, I got a call yesterday from somebody and the best answer i could give him was tell the truth um that's the best advice and it's not it was a five minute phone call where i told him to tell the truth you i'd love to take people's money i'd love it i mean that's my business my business is to make money in the end but i'm not going to be dishonest and take people's money when they don't shouldn't be paying me so i said at this point you wouldn't be it wouldn't be worthwhile to hire me just tell, just be honest, and if the situation arises where you do need representation, give me a call. Yeah. But at this point in time, I'm not going to sit around and say, try to take your money for, for what I think is something that you can do yourself, which is be honest and tell the story as you just told me. That makes sense. Um, that's different and rare to have an honest lawyer. Um, that's different, but... <laughs> I know it's because you come from a place of ethics mm -hmm. and integrity, which is really rare. Um, and not just because of your industry, I'm being a little snarky, but uh, I, I, just in general, that's mm -hmm. rare. I, I, having my own practice, I don't need to meet the requirements and the overhead that, I mean, I, I work out of my house, so I don't need to meet those requirements that other attorneys might need to meet. Um, I don't have employees. I, I don't have the overhead. Um, income's coming from multiple sources. So it, it it's fun. And I never would have thought I would say that as an attorney. I But I, I have fun what, with what I do because I can pick and choose my cases. Nobody's handing something to me and I'm saying, you have to do this. I'm just doing it because I want to. That, I think that's beautiful. the beautiful aspect of being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the, the industry that you're in and the way that that goes with kind of rolling over and choosing. As I know you have a couple of um, areas that you can segment. There's the potential conflict area where you have to X yourself out, mm -hmm. um, potentially covering someone. Um, and then, of course, you get to roll through, no, not this one. This is a win. This is a challenge, you know, yeah. <laughs> and just kind of going down the list. That's pretty cool, actually. I'm and it, it, it's really just being authentic with my, myself. As long as I stay in, in authenticity um, with who I am, and, and that's actually why my legal practice has continued to grow. Because um, I was doing the consulting work, but I'm still doing trials, and, and this is a little plug for me versus my competition. I hate to do it, but I'm going to do it. 
Um, do it. <laughs> I'm I'm still practicing. And I, I, it wouldn't be authentic for me to work with people on going to trial if I said, I haven't done a trial in five years. I haven't been, I, I'm not even a barred attorney anymore. I am a barred attorney. I'm still practicing. I'm still taking clients. I'm still taking cases to court. I'm still seeing what's going on in courthouses. Mm -hmm. So when my clients have questions for me, I can answer them because I'm still in the game at that yeah. point. Um, nothing wrong. I mean, I could, I could legitimately go out and do my practice without practicing law, but I wouldn't, it wouldn't be authentic for me because it wouldn't mean that I am honing my skills and improving on my craft. Now that was the very suit and polish shoes Rob talking just now, right? <laughs> With, you know, because it's about authentic, authenticity and sharpening the blade that is my skill. But isn't there a part of you inside that just loves the kill? Like, this is like... I, I love to win. I love to win. <laughs> I mean, I love to win. And there's a lot of attorneys out there that that's not the big thing for them. And I, mm -hmm. they just want to help people. That's not me. I, I thought I was going to be a lifetime DA because I like to win. I like to prosecute. I like to... That's just me. That is just... Uh, I was, I'm not a person that believes in participation awards. I'm not there to participate. I'm there to win. Absolutely. I know that's right. You said you want to do more than participate. I am not mad at that at all. That is excellent. Well, that makes me think, you know, you have it easy in the networking circle because you can basically politely, professionally shut it down with have them call my office, mm -hmm. right? Which isn't and, and necessarily the case for, for everyone. No, it, it's not. Um, and, and it's taken me a lot of work. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not out working for my health. Yeah. Uh, as I said, I like making money. I'm not, I'm not there because I'm having fun doing it. I'm there to make money. That's why I'm networking with people. So if I'm giving free advice, they don't need my services, or they're going to find somebody else who might be cheaper than me. I'm not there to haggle price. I'm there to get to know people. I'm there to gain connections so that the connections come back to me in return. Could you please shout that from the heavens at every single networking event, because I know you speak professionally as well. Mm -hmm. Please share that information with everyone, because there are so many people, and you know, they don't know how to network, and they don't understand the essence is not to make a deal in the room, um, or to, like you said, to make to give free information and then wonder, mm -hmm. why didn't we have such a good connection over there? Why didn't they call me? <laughs> they got everything they needed mm -hmm. in the hour-long exactly. conversation you had with them. So I think that is incredible information that we will highlight all over iTunes, YouTube, everything when we put this podcast up. Cause that was just an incredible point that people miss. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's yeah. taken me time. I mean, I've been networking since 2011, I started in 2011, and finally am figuring out it out in the past year. It takes time. It takes time to learn any new skill. That's true. So don't beat yourself up when you're not good at it. I'm, I'm still not good at it, um, but I, I'm learning, and it's just a process, and I'm well, always learning. That's a really good point, too, Rob. Like, everything is constant growth. So even after you've mastered something, there's still mm -hmm. some room to get better because of a new technology, a new challenge. You walk into a, a different networking environment where they just have a completely different setup. Maybe you're not used to speed networking or you just come from speed networking. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many different elements that we can all grow. And when you feel like there's no room for growth, you shouldn't do it anymore. Yeah, Whatever it, that exactly. is. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And, and getting back, you know, to, to the overall theme of, of balancing things in your life. If there's no room for growth, then there's no balance and it's just a dead weight that you're dragging along. You should be excited to do whatever you do, especially if you own your own business. You should be excited to wake up and do your own business. I mean, that's why you're doing it. If, it, if not, if it just becomes that anger, then there, yeah. again, there is no balance. There is no work-life balance. There is no real quality of life. And your family life is going to suffer. Your life with your, your friends are going to suffer. You yourself are going to suffer just because there is a ball and chain connected to your ankle pulling you down. Absolutely. But struck with an emotion of guilt because you sacrificed so much to build what you've mm -hmm. now started to detest. So there's a whole other element to that as well. But you yeah. brought up a really good point because I think a lot of people, whether they're entrepreneur or not, just 
professionals that are helping in, in various roles, when you lose focus and you feel like you can't get it back, mm -hmm. it adds such an element of frustration to people that some shake and some don't. So how do you, because you're multitasking, you're, you're blending modalities, you're moving and shaking between, you know, dad hat, husband hat, trial hat, consultant hat, you know, like you're, you're shaking. So how do you stay focused on the task in front of you or, or refocus if you felt like you got pulled left or right? Good question. Um, <laughs> I think it goes back to uh, something I had mentioned earlier about identity and roles, is that we all have our identity. We are, you know, you pull out your driver's license, that's your identity. You are Nikita Thigpen. That, that's just you. Um, I am Rob Graff, but I have different roles. I have the lawyer role. I have the consultant role. I have the dad role. I have the husband role. I have the networking role. Yeah. speaker role, I, I, the list could go on. And no matter how good or how bad I am at each of those roles, no matter whether I succeed at one role that day or fail at that role that day, I still am who I am. And knowing that and being confident in who I am is, makes the world a difference. So one role can go really poorly and just say, well, I'm blowing that off. And now I have to move on to the next thing. Plus, nobody wants to see me shake. Nobody wants to see me in, in the jobs that I have. Nobody wants to see me as a non-confident person. Yeah. So if I know who I am and confident that I did the best that I could, and again, I like to win, so best that I could doesn't always sit well with me, but knowing that I did the best that I could is sometimes the best that I can get out of a situation. So I don't like to say I ever lose in the situation because I'm always learning something from that situation. So the best that I could is my words of saying I didn't lose. I found the opportunity in the challenge. Do you believe in that? Um, you might have heard it in maybe elementary school. Uh, teachers would say you get an A for effort. Do you, you, do you <laughs> your whole face just cringe <laughs> at the A for effort. <laughs> Isn't that an E for effort? And isn't that between the D and the F? <laughs> I swear E's used to exist when I was in elementary school, and then they, they somehow disappeared, and now it's just A, B, C, D, and F. Yeah, you get an E for effort. Or I got a C on the paper, a C me. It's not something good. I'm not there to, part I'm not there to participate. I I'm there to win. And, and I think in every situation, whether you, know, you own your own business or you work for somebody else, in a, especially in a sales role or any role where you are the front, the face of whatever product or service you are providing, you are there to win. If you're there to participate, those that you're speaking to are going to see that you're there to participate and they're going to think you're hiding something. They're going to think that you're not really authentic or really who you should be. Um, what What's missing there? I, I like to speak with my clients about making three charts. A chart that shows what your qualities that your close family would say about you, qualities that your close friends would say about you, and qualities that a stranger would say about you. Yeah. And obviously the list of family is going to be really, really long. Friends probably close, if not just as long. And strangers that you just met, probably not long at all. But why? And how can you make the way you act towards strangers just as authentic as the way you act towards your family and friends? There's the adage that we buy from people we like. That's why a lot of sales training programs teach bonding. That's why a lot of sales training programs teach rapport. So why aren't we being our authentic selves? Why aren't we allowing ourselves to be more open with people we just met at a networking event, at a sales meeting? Be honest with ourselves. If, we would call out, I would, well, maybe me, I would call out somebody. If I don't feel they're being honest with me, I would say something. If, if I'm being asked a loaded question, I'm going to say something. Yeah. The person asking me a loaded question is knowing they're asking me a loaded question. So saying something to them is actually going to help me gain their respect and actually allow us to bond a little further, which would lead possibly to us working together or, you know, a bigger um, a, a mutual respect or understanding for each other where we want to work together because we are not 
beating around the bush with anything that's going on. That helps you be dynamic. You know, if I had to think of three areas, knowing you in a professional realm that I know you in, I would definitely say that you're authentic. Um, I would also say that you're raw because you're very straightforward. And I don't mean raw in the gritty way, just in a very, mm -hmm. there's, you don't have to peek in the can and figure out what's beneath there. It's really clear what's right mm -hmm. there. Um, and you're very comedic, but that's just because I've, I've seen you in other elements that maybe other people wouldn't say that. But those are the three ways that I would list you out hands mm -hmm. down. But everything you just described um, is it makes sense why you do what you do, helping other potential or current trial attorneys perfect their craft because mm -hmm. you're helping them see what a loaded question is and read through it, flip it around and give it back, um, whether it's in the courtroom or preparing, because I don't know much about law, but all the stuff that you have to do to prepare for it before they get there interviewing, I don't know, witnesses, what, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. All those <laughs> well, it's good that you don't know what goes on in the courtroom. That's a good thing. <laughs> Right. Because <laughs> then we'd have other questions like, Nikita, why do you know what, what goes on? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I think that's amazing because as you were talking, I'm listening to you have a conversation with someone else that you're shaping. Like I could see you saying, John or Judy, you know, this is why you need to pay attention to those questions, mm -hmm. not just because you're looking for the element of how to protect your client, but so that you come off a certain way. Because I think you and I had a conversation about that many moons ago, how important it is to have confidence um, in what you're doing, period, but especially as a trial attorney. So mm -hmm. I was, then I was literally, literally having that visual, you know I'm very visual, um, when you were talking about that. And that, that makes you awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it brings to mind, I, I do interviews for my college, we do alumni interviews, we don't have on-campus interviews, and I met this girl a couple years ago, and number one, I never like to write any bad things about these kids when I turn in what I turn in, because they're kids, and they, they have hopes, and they have dreams, and me writing something bad is just feels wrong. I, I met this girl, and I'm assuming she's smart be just because she wouldn't have applied to the school where she didn't think she was going to get in, but maybe she did. Um, but there was something about her that I don't think her grades were as high as, as other people's grades were, but there was something about her. She had, she was able to actively listen. And she had, I want to call, I'm going to say it was just street smart. She was listening to the questions I was asking her or the statements I was saying and being able to internalize them and then respond with a question. So there was just a different level of thinking. And I remember writing the essay, and I'll never forget this, saying, I don't know what her grades are, but she needs consideration just because she'll probably go further than most of the other kids at this school, just because she is able to listen and able to take in what she hears around her and move forward from there. Um, she unfortunately did not get in, but, uh, they, but people like that, and, and I, I teach some of that, we have to be able to be open and listen. And if we're authentic with ourselves and able to be balanced and mindful and calm and centered, then we can listen to other people. And we have that intuition to hear what other people are saying beyond what they are saying and then respond with the correct response. The appro let's put it, I'm not going to say correct, the appropriate response or an appropriate response to a situation. So, I, it's taken me years to learn this because I did work in court and I didn't realize, you know, with my coaching where I was really getting it from and why I enjoyed what I did. But it, it all kind of made sense. And, and it's a teachable skill. Other people are going to be better at it than others. Probably women are going to be better at it than men. But it is a teachable skill, active listening. And I, I try to teach it all the time. I agree. Um, and so what I do, because, you know, I believe in challenging everyone to greatness, starting with me, mm -hmm. is I challenge everyone to make room for that ability, though. If you're a junkie in your head mm -hmm. and you're clouded with a bunch of other people's thoughts, other people's expectations, other people's comparisons of, oh, Rob, you can or can't do whatever. It may not even be something you want to do. And because they told you you can't, now you're going to. You know, like, right. just all right. that junk gets in there. But if you don't make room uh, by finding some way to kind of just release out the, 
junk, like all that crap, the negativity. And sometimes it's not um, direct negativity. It's that backhanded, which you would be able to uh, delineate between because you could, you know, sense when someone's being, mm -hmm. you know, ridiculous, really. Um, but not everybody has that skill. That is truly a skill to be able to say, wait a minute, you were just trying to tell me that I'm a fool. You said something totally different, but you just called me a fool, you know. And some people hold on to those mm -hmm. things and they'll, you know, lay you out in the moment, but then they're thinking like, well, maybe I wasn't as strong as a speaker as I should have been or uh, maybe I stumbled over my words too much, or maybe they didn't understand me. Maybe I really did come across as a, a fool. So now they've taken on all this junk, and they didn't make room to even impart that skill of active listening. So now they transition in their hat because we're all multitasking in, in this day and age. Most likely, if you're living in America, you're doing multiple things in some way or some level. And now they just left this situation and transitioned maybe to white hat. And mm -hmm. now their husband's trying to have a really serious conversation, but they're not active listening because they got all that junk mm -hmm. in there. So does that happen to you sometimes when you have to find ways to just kind of release junk, whatever the junk is? It may have nothing to do with confidence, but to just release that negativity, those toxic, toxic emotions, you know, what do you do for you so that you can release? Um, I exercise. I, I uh, started a program, and I'm not going to throw it out because I don't know if there's time. But it's it's a program that is 25 minutes long, and I, I, I drop drops from the gym, and I do all these DVDs. Um, so it's a 25 minute long program, and it is the toughest workout I've done in years. Um, but I just started it. But really, working out, um, spending that time working out, and, and making the time for that. If it's something that's important to me, I, I make the time to do it. So it's important that it's 25 minutes long because the shorter the better. Um, I always like to say that it's funny that working out was something that my wife and I did a lot together when we were first, before we were married and when we were first married and then we had a child and having a child, you don't have time to work out anymore. Um, so we both started to put on a little weight and we were arguing a lot more and it was stressful and then we started doing and i'm going to say p90x we started doing p90x and i tell people i think p90x saved my marriage because it was we would put our son to bed and then we would change and go downstairs and work out together and it was a tough program we did a lot of push-ups but we would work out together and i say it helped us reconnect and find a a time to spend together that was just our time and it was something that was so important when to just clear Clear the mind. Um, I, I like watching TV. I can stare at TV and just blank out. I don't mm -hmm. have the time for TV anymore, but I used to be able to just stare at the TV. We don't have that time. So working out for me is really the key thing. We're listening to music as well. I am cracking up over here, and I know you can see me, but once this is out, not everybody else is going to be able to see my little special faces that I make. Um, T25, I'm assuming that that's your, your 25, is it T25? Yes, yes it is okay. T25. <laughs> I'm a beach body advocate. A little small thing that nobody knows about me, I used to be a beach body coach. Mm. I, was, I was really heavy into it. Um, and then life, <laughs> the life yeah. just happened. Um, but I'm still really closely connected with a lot of amazing beach body coaches, so I'm always supporting and trying Tayo and everything else that comes out. Um, but Sean T is um, killing me. He's killing Sean me. Sean T, yo, he's he's a beast. That's all oh I want to say. He's talking, and and you can tell he's like out of breath too. He's talking and he's doing it. I'm dying. <laughs> I had um an experience with Sean T when we had a brick and mortar office location in Lansdowne when we first first opened up a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, I would get my employees together, and we would in the the lobby area was the most spacious room that you could be in. We would do Sean T's rocking body because at mm -hmm. the time that that was out this yeah. 25 and all the other stuff was there. And we thought we were going to laugh and joke through this thing and just have a good 20-minute break because really I practice what I preach with infusing balance and everything. Um, and it was the most difficult, ridiculous thing that I had ever done. First of all, I realized how uncoordinated I am, um, which is a little jarring because I used to be, you know, I did my thing in high school way back in the day when I had to go to house parties and dance. But clearly those days have long since passed. Um, 
<laughs> but I was really laughing at you when you talked about P90X saving your marriage. That's real. And the reason I was smiling is because P90X almost killed mine. Uh, my husband and I tried maybe four or five years ago. It was P90 and P90X just came out before mm -hmm. the next one. Um, so I'm, um, we're a very sarcastic family. We laugh a lot. We have such a great time. But sometimes we can go left. We can, you know, we can mm -hmm. cross the boundary of that joke. And I would always make these comments about Tony Horton. Like, look at that, babe. He's 52 and he's rocking. And, <laughs> and like, come on, get down. You're not doing enough push-ups. Get down, do it harder. And he would look at me like, you better be quiet. <laughs> you ain't down here doing these push-ups. Because I couldn't do as many. And my excuse was, well, I'm a girl. So I don't have to go as hard. And we would we laughed and had a lot of fun. But we had to stop P90X because it was getting real. It was yeah, getting real. I here. get it. I get it. <laughs> So we know what you do to release. How do you refuel? Like, what do you do to get your energy back up? Because I know physically the release of those, you know, those angry, negative, complicated, junky emotions come out with you exercising. But mm -hmm. is refueling different for you? Or is refueling kind of the same? Uh, it is the same, but it's different in, I would add, I go get a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I found... It was amazing. I didn't start drinking coffee until I was 27, 28. Um, I, I was in court, and we would have a lot of time, so I, we would go get coffee uh, from the DA's office. That's just what we did. Um, and I found out I like coffee in, in, to an extent. Um, I like it with a lot of sugar. I, I like it with milk and chemicals. Let's put it that way, because I used to eat in love. So milk and chemicals. Uh but for me, it is getting that cup of coffee and having that time to just unwind and drink my cup of coffee extremely quickly. I don't do anything slow, but at the same time, it's still my ability to refuel and recharge at that point, to have that cup of coffee and to just, again, clear my head in a different way. Yeah. So it, it energizes me. And I'm not saying it's the caffeine. It's really the, the time and, and the taste and the, the experience. It's the moment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I put on LinkedIn a lot about permission to pause. It's your, mm -hmm. mo it's your moment. 30 seconds or 10 minutes, it doesn't matter. It allows you to just kind of reset yeah. uh, mentally. And, and if that's part of your refueling process, to just, you know, let me reset and transition between, you know, litigator to consultant to mm -hmm. networker, you know, whatever it is. Um, I think that that's pretty amazing because it's a quick and expensive way. Yeah, refuel. yeah, it adds unless, up, but it's a it's, 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 I was thinking about that as I said it, like, well, it depends on what part of the city you're in, but yeah. <laughs> we got a coffee pot. Um, so what about resting? What do you do to rest, to rest? I have been a person that can just lay in bed and shut off their mind, and I know a lot of people can't do that. Um, mm -hmm. As my, my son was up at 3.30 yesterday morning. Um, and he doesn't go back to sleep. And I'm not the type of person that can just go back to sleep easily. I, I can, my head hits the pillow and I'm still awake, but I can just turn off my mind. So I just laid there quietly, not a thought in my head, just laid there, my eyes were closed and I was just resting. Um, for me also, it's watching TV, uh, or I know they say playing on your iPad keeps you awake. It actually is the type of thing for me, it's like reading a book. It, it actually kind of calms me down at night. I, I play a little bit, I get tired, and then I go to, I go to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, I watch some TV on my iPad, and that helps me go to sleep. Um, so those types of things really are just the ways that kind of unwind me. I, I can sit there and, and watch TV or lay in bed and not think of anything if I'm really tired and I'm not at 3 a.m. I'm not going to get on the iPad. That's that's a bad idea. So it's really just whatever is that moment at that time, I it relaxes me. And uh, I'm going to throw this out. I used to prepare my I, I actually give CLEs on preparing without scripting uh, for trial. I used to I, I didn't I only wrote my first opening and closing ever. Um, I haven't written them since then. I take notes. Uh, but what, what I do is I lay in bed and think about what I'm going to say and kind of script it in my head. Mm -hmm. And 
that relaxes me. It is a weird experience. I can lay in bed and just feel at peace, calm, and think of what I'm going to say when I'm in front of people. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Um, that's not good for everyone. No, some people no. have anxiety connected to it where they, mm-hmm. they're laying in bed and using your example, they're scripting, but then they're reworking and reworking and reworking mm-hmm. and reworking and they can't turn it off. I, um, I agree. There's, there's a lot of people that shouldn't be doing that. Absolutely. What you have, you need to put it in a bottle and package it and sell it. Um, (laughs) Got to find a way to package it. That's a billion dollar, a billion, made that up, a billion dollar business right there. To turn your mind off is Mm -hmm. really serious. I talk to people a lot. It's a huge part of what I do in my coaching practice is to help people learn how to turn the volume down and control it. And it's it's huge and it's frustrating for everyone involved in the process. I I sometimes wonder if it's a gender thing, too. I mean, I, I think, mm-hmm. it, I, I don't know if women have that, or the very rare woman will have the ability to turn their mind off. I mean, are you guys, saying this is a man versus woman thing, Rob? Like, are you, I, are you I, saying that? We're wired differently. We're just wired differently. It, 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 it is what it is. I, I think it's, it, it takes women a lot more practice. They, that's why women can, I think, are better active listeners. That's why there's women's intuition. These things might be old wives tales but they're they're real i mean there's something very real about them or they wouldn't exist in the first place so i I think they all it all kind of wires together in how people are and different people are different ways but i think women are are, are less likely to be able to not go over the day and not remember certain things while guys can just stop Mm -hmm. and that's it that's a whole nother conversation right there. You're about to be it in is. trouble. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be in trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Mm-hmm. I see that lawyer look right now in your face. You're trying to flip this around. <laughs> I'm, completely, I'm just saying that it's not good for everybody. And, and sometimes, you know, uh, it might be a gender thing. It might be how we're wired differently. It's true. I'm going to look into that. That's a, um, it's a really good question, quite honestly. Like all jokes aside, it's a good question of is there really something about maybe the hormonal difference in, in testosterone and estrogen and, you know, the variances there of why you guys are, you guys literally, no pun intended, are just better at turning down or turning off some things and kind of transitioning where ours kind of roll it, I think it's, it's why there's more women now in grad school and why there's more women now in, in law school. Because I think, and I'm not trying to be stereotypical, but I think women are better suited for the roles of lawyers and how to think like a lawyer because they are, most women stereotypically are more detail-oriented than men and more focused and able to focus better than men. But and it's a double-edged sword because you go over everything in your head over and over and over again. Yeah. But that's what law practice is. That's what the practice of law is. So it, it, it's really, it's, it's a blessing and, and it's a curse at the same time. As most things are. So yeah. I'm going to accept that as women who rule the world, starting with the courtroom. You just said it. Rob Graff said women rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's a perfect connection because the last part, we already covered kind of how you refocus. So the last part of the power five that we talk about um, is really reconnecting. So how do you reconnect with your why? What do you do? Because you happen to be married. Not all of our listeners are, but you happen to be. So what do you do to reconnect with her? Uh, I like to just sometimes put what I'm doing to the side. Um, last night's a great example. I was out. I I, I gave a talk last night. Um, Roads were not that bad. Um, But I got home and it was around 8 o'clock and I said, I'm going to sit with you. I I could go exercise now and be in bed early. But I know she likes to go to bed earlier than me. Um, A lot earlier. So I said, I'm going to sit with you. And I'd rather sit with her and spend the time talking and hearing about stuff than trying to fit everything in later or just say, you went to bed. I want to go do what I want to do. Um, we also, she gives me a call every day when she's done work to talk and I hear about her day. And because we don't really have time to talk as much at dinner, especially now that there's a child there. He likes yeah. to talk and likes to tell us stuff. <laughs> so 
it's really you know finding that time. So the, the call after work, the um, the time that I put my time to the side because I was out, and that makes my wife a single parent for the time that I'm out, which is a lot more stressful than when both of us are there. So why don't I hear and put what I have to do to the side to spend time with her? You're awesome. I try. <laughs> You can tell her. You're awesome. That, no, that's really good that you actually don't just turn off for yourself so that you can rest, but you turn off all of the, you know, multitasking that you do for her and just give her, I mean, there's no greater gift for anyone who's in a committed relationship than to really receive the other person being with them in the moment and not being preoccupied with 20 other things. Like, yeah, babe, we're at dinner. We're, we're going out. We're, you know, moving and shaking together through this theater. But I'm really thinking about the case that I have to put together tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really just, it's incredible that you're able to do that for her. That's awesome. And, and the time for any anything that you're doing, whether it's a child, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a significant other, no matter what, it doesn't have to be long. Mm -hmm. People would rather have five minutes of quality time than three hours of quantity. That's right. Because I, I could be focused on one other thing and not being paying attention for three hours, the person's not going to feel special. There's going to be no connection. There's no, going to be no reconnection right there. Five minutes of that time spending together, that's quality, is so much more important than that actual mm -hmm. amount of time. I totally agree on so many levels. So I have to say, talking about connection, how do people connect with you? You know, balance beamers all over the world are going to be looking and listening to this amazing man who just said women rule the world, starting with the courtroom. <laughs> so how do they connect with you? I can be reached uh, via my website, which is graphstandard.com, or uh, you can shoot me an email, robert at graphstandard.com. Uh, like my page on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, which is Graph Standard, Facebook pages, facebook.com slash Graph Standard. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, we are a very connected world, and so there are many ways to get a hold of me. Let me just say that the branding is tight because everything is Graph Standard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you so much for being with us. You stay right there. Don't go anywhere. Balance Beamers, we thank you for joining us for this particular segment of Balance Beam. We welcome you to return right after this moment. And we super appreciate Rob for bringing justice and liberty to the beam. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> welcome back again, Balance Beamers. I hope you enjoyed all of that goodness that Rob Brad Esquire just gave out to us. He was honest, he was raw, he was authentic, and he was pretty incredibly awesome, especially considering he said, women rule the world, starting with the courtroom. Um, and although I don't walk in the world of the courtroom traditionally, although I've had to be an expert witness a few times under my clinical hat, beyond that, I think that's a great place for us to start because that's where a lot of formidable decisions are made about how this country is run. But beyond that, it was such a pleasure and a joy to interview a man of his stature who is really a decision maker on so many levels and a major influencer. Talk about how he's human and how he deals with balancing his life and his business. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and you look forward to the next one in just a few weeks away. In the meantime, make sure if you're not already a registered community member for the Kickstart Balance program, make sure you go right over to bigpro.com and register for free to be a part of our community. In our community, we offer all kinds of tips and resources around the power five, those things you need to do to refocus so you can balance across the board in your life. And if you have a business, you'll be able to accelerate it because you're now in the zone and refocus. Until next time, I welcome you to just continue to play in the community and come talk with me at ThinkPro on Twitter or at ThinkPro on Instagram, two of my most favorite places to play. But you can catch me on other multiple social media streams as well. We look forward to next time. <laughs>